quickly, I just wanted to make sure there was a, a question which I think is relevant to everybody. And that was about, you know, when you have a list of results um, and, and the question in the exercise, for example, is look at the product descriptions and, and see if the, the product descriptions make sense, right? Are, are, are these genes that you would expect to be present in the liver stage, for example, or in the extracellular matrix of, uh, uh, you know, entamoeba uh, or, or, or any other, whatever organism you're looking at. Um, and there are a couple of options available to you. So obviously, if you have a hundred genes, looking through them one by one at the product descriptions is, is tedious. Um, one option is to do a quick and dirty um, uh, word cloud on the product on the words that are in your product description. So if you click on this little graph on the column product descriptions, you will get a word cloud here that shows you every word in your product descriptions. And if you mouse over them, it gives you a number. So I can tell, for example, in this particular search, uh, there are 38 occurrences of the word kinase, right? And so that that will that will be very helpful for you. You can also look at this in tabular format right here. And so I can you can filter on it, for example, and say uh, you know, kinase, and, and then it'll filter and show you the results that have the word kinase in them. The other option, which we also explored in our breakout, is you can analyze the results and do enrichment analyses. And you'll notice that there are three options here. We'll talk about this more tomorrow. Um, there's go enrichment, there's metabolic pathway enrichment, and then there's word enrichment. The word enrichment, what it's doing, it's going to take the words that are present in the names of your proteins, and it's going to determine if there is a word in there that's statistically enriched in your results, in the names of your results, compared to the background, which is the entire genome. So, so what are the chances that you picked these 50 genes by random or not, basically? Um, or that they are random, basically. And so uh, and so that's another option for you to do the, the analysis in bulk. Anyway, that's all I was going to say about this, uh, just to make sure uh, everybody else caught it. Um, are there any other instructors, anything else you wanted to bring up from the last breakouts before we move on to Mark and talk about orthology? Uh, Omar, there is some important announcement not related to exercises. Uh, are you, have you read what Rachel told you or should I mention it? Uh, no, I have not. I was sharing my screen, so I can't look at uh, Slack <laughs> communications. So go, go ahead. Okay. I, I thought you were going to make the announcement. Go ahead and make okay. it. Okay, okay, no. It's just to inform people, there is uh, some issue with Zoom, uh, some uh, authentication process. So please, if you don't have to log out out of Zoom, don't do it. You may not run into the issue, but if you do, you might not be able to log back again. So if you're gonna leave your computer, just leave it logged into Zoom. Thank you. Okay, good point, yeah. <clears throat> All right, Mark, um, I'm gonna stop sharing and put it in your capable hands. And you're muted right now. <clears throat> Thanks, Omar. Okay. I'll turn my mute off and that will help. Yeah, you we can understand hear you now. this better. <laughs> Great. So I'm going to talk to you about orthology. It's sort of um, been in, intertwined in all of the tutorials so far, but we use orthology a lot <clears throat> at at the ViewPath DB websites, and I'm going to discuss that. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction to orthology to make sure that we're all on the same page. And for those who don't study orthology, um, it, it sometimes um, the definitions um, are not very clear. So I'll try to make those clear. Um, and then I'm going to talk about OrthoMCL, which we have alluded to before. But that's our website that we use to identify orthologs and um, allow you to um, look at and analyze orthologous groups. And then I'm going to talk about how we can view orthology at ViewPath DB sites. And then just quickly mention at the ends how to annotate your new genome or your set of proteins um, using OrthoMCL groups. And then I'm going to hand it back to Omar, and he's going to go through a couple searches that show you our orthology capabilities at ViewPath sites. So, first, what I got to move things around here. Um, what is orthology? So 
it's best to show this with an example, and you can look here at alpha tubulin. It's present in lots of species, including Plasmodium and Puccinia, and those are considered or orthologs. Um, excuse me, there we go. Those are considered orthologs. They actually share function, and that's a really important definition of orthologs that the, they um, have basically the same function in different species. How do they derive? So this is um, one common mechanism of, of how genes um, evolve to be in multiple species. During speciation, um, a common ancestor will contain this gene, alpha tubulin, and then pass it to the two um, the, to progeny species. So that's how orthologs arise. They rise from a speciation of events. So now consider another gene, beta tubulin. They're considered orthologs as well. And how do they arise? Through speciation. So that same common ancestor also had a copy of beta tubulin. So those are orthologs. Now imagine that Puccinia has this other gene called beta-2 tubulin. It's very similar to beta tubulin, and those are considered paralogs. They're not orthologs, but they're paralogs. And why are they paralogs? It's because they arose through a gene duplication event within Puccinia or some related species after the entire speciation events that led to alpha versus beta tubulin. So a gene duplication resulted in beta tubulin, beta two tubulin. And beta two tubulin is very similar to beta, tu beta tubulin. A lot of people ask, are alpha tubulin and beta tubulin, are they considered paralogs? because they're very similar to each other and they're in the same species. And you said, you know, maybe uh, it, these two things arose by a gene, gene duplication events. We consider them not to be paralogs. So they're totally different genes. And it's because they've diverged so much in sequence and therefore in function to have totally different functions um, alpha tubulin cannot replace beta tubulin and vice versa. And so they're not considered orthologs. You might consider them as part of the tubulin family, but they're not um, um, homologous. So why do we care about orthology? Why is it useful? Why am I talking to you about this? So one way that it's useful is that you can learn about your favorite gene even though there might not be anything known about your gene, by looking at your gene's orthologs. So here's an example. In Plasmodium, there's this gene. Its description is it's conserved unknown function. We've all seen that. It's um, quite disappointing. But then we can examine the orthologs and learn about some, some different things like conservation. The orthologs are actually present in eukaryotes, amoeba, alveolates, um, fungi, metazoans, but there's no orthologs in bacteria or archaea. And may, they may, this may give you some clue that it's involved in some eukaryotic process like um, eukaryotic type chromatin. Two, uh, you can learn about the structure. Many orthologs have this SRR domain and that may indicate, it's not clear what this domain does, but it shows you that um, they all um, contain a similar structure. And this might lead to a similar function. So below, I'm gonna show you some putative functions of orthologs of, of this particular plasmodium protein. And you can see it's all over the place, um, but there seems to be a common theme that it has to do something with DNA and chromatin, like centromere binding, um, chromatin binding um, um, protein, and a transcription factor. So 
In this way, orthology can be very useful to understand your gene. So now onto the OrthoMCL website where we use um, this site to identify and study orthologous groups. So I'm gonna talk about that here. And here's the website and I encourage you to go over there and use it as an accessory to whatever website you're using like PlasmoDB or FungiDB. So let's go back to our example of alpha and beta tubulin in these two species and, and see how ortho-MCL works to identify them as paralogs or orthologs. So the ortho-MCL algorithm works like this. There's an all versus all blast. So that means every protein sequence in every species is blasted against every other protein in the same species or in other species. So this alpha tubulin is blasted against this beta tubulin. This alpha tubulin is blasted against every other, um, every other gene, including all these tubulins. We identify the best hits. So what are the top um, blast um, sequences that are hit? And then we form groups with related proteins. Then we refine these groups um, using Markov clustering algorithm. So let's just look at how this would work. So alpha tubulin, if you blast it, it will, in Puccinia, you blast it against all the Puccinia proteins, the top hit will be alpha tubulin. And in likewise, if you take alpha tubulin for Puccinia, blast it against all the pla plasmodium um, proteins, that will be the best hit. That's called the reciprocal best hit. And that would indicate that that is an ortholog. And then you can do the same thing with beta tubulin to identify those as orthologs. And then you can blast um, proteins against all the other proteins within the same species. And the reciprocal best hit if you blast beta tubulin against all the Puccinia proteins would beta, be beta two tubulin. So I just want to note that. Um, uh, alpha tubulin will, if you blast it against all the plasmodium proteins, it will pick up beta tubulin, but it picks up better alpha tubulin in other species. So this score of this relationship is stronger than this score of alpha tubulin to beta tubulin, showing that they're orthologs and these are not paralogs. And I'm happy to go into more detail if you're interested. So at OrthoMCL, we have about 855,000 ortho groups, and they range in size from one, which is a very, ice, um, a very unique protein, say, in a particular species, and it may be resulted from a recent gene duplication. And um, some of the groups have about 14,000 proteins, and those are proteins that are very well conserved across lots of species. So how many species do we have there? We have 677 organisms and you can find them um, on the website and at this page. And what are these organisms? Well, it's all the view path organisms, about 400 or so, plus other organisms, model organisms um, that you'd probably be interested in, proteomes that are well annotated, which happen to be a lot of the model organisms, or representatives of the species tree, because we wanted to try to capture all the types of genes that are present across the tree of life. So a group page at OrthoMCL shows information about each group. And um, here's an example. This um, protein, this group um, contains 617 proteins. It is uh, DNA polymerase. These keywords show up in lots of protein descriptions. And so you can see it's a DNA polymerase um, delta. It shows the common EC numbers. This particular EC number has to do with DNA polymerase. It's present in 83 of the proteins. So those have been annotated with this EC number. And then it searches for all the PFAM domains and the proteins. And you can see that 599 contain this first um, PFAM domain. Another feature of this group page is the domain architecture. 
And here's the legends. You can see this PF04042 is a DNA polymerase subunit. This is its color so that you can understand its architecture within each protein. I'm only showing you two of the 617 proteins, but you can see the size of the proteins, and then you can see the domain located within um, the confines of the protein sequence. And this helps you to compare your protein of interest with all of the other orthologs or, or paralogs and see how well um, does it compare in structure. You can look, I think Omar showed this earlier, you can look at the phyletic distribution of this ortholog group, and you can see that there are proteins in many, many eukaryotes, but none in archaea or in bacteria. So it's a well-conserved eukaryotic type protein. And then you can look at the list of proteins, um, and you can even do clustal omega alignments of these, of these protein sequences to look for conserved residues. Um, and you can look at, at descriptions and compare. If, you're a, if you have an unknown protein, you'd be excited to know that there's many, many proteins here that are um, marked with DNA polymerase delta, small subunit. So also on this group page, um, on, on some of them, we can only um, accommodate smaller groups of 500 proteins or less, we can create a cluster graph that shows you the relationship between all of these proteins. Proteins that are, uh, each um, circle is a protein and pr circles that are closer together represent proteins that are more closely related. And you can separate by taxa, by PFAM domains. I thought the PFAM domain um, option here was pretty interesting. You can see that um, most of them have these two red and blue domains, but some of them up here in a group have just the red domain, where those others at this other side of the graph contain only the blue. So how do we use this at the view path sites? Another example is um, useful here. So looking at this gene, conserved and unknown, um, I look into the orthology section and it can see an orthology, orthologs and paralogs uh, table. This lists all the orthologs and paralogs within PlasmoDB. So it's all plasmo related species. And if you want to look wider, I would recommend that you click on this link, the ortholog group, um, to go over to OrthoMCL and look at the proteins from all the different species, including um, Plasmo and others. On the same gene page, you can scroll down and you go to the synthony section and you can see different strains. This is um, the chromosome and lots of different species. And what you're looking at are um, these shaded bars those represent orthologous relationships. All these proteins along this um, vertical, that, sorry, um, that I'm scrolling along here, they are all in the same ortholog group. Whereas all of these proteins are in the same ortholog group. And this is showing the syntony, syntony of these chromosomes, the gene structure or um, is, is very similar between these species. And a really useful feature is this function prediction section. And what we use, uh, um, this function prediction se section shows you the EC numbers of this group. And you can see that Uniprot, a database, um, assigned this protein 3.1.3 um, EC number, and that means it's a phosphoric monoester hydrolase. And we actually at OrthoMCL use orthology to assign these numbers as well. So this was computationally inferred. So it, it happened that OrthoMCL made this prediction of this EC number for this particular protein. But often, a protein might not have an official annotation from say something like Uniprot. 
And that's really where orthology is really useful in figuring out what this protein does and what EC number it has. And in this following table, EC numbers, scores for computational inference, you can get an idea of why OrthoMCL decided to assign this protein 3.1.3. dash. So let, let's look at this data. The, it, it had very similar length to all the other proteins in the ortholog group that contains um, this EC number. It had a so-so BLAST score with these proteins. It shared the domains with these proteins at four out of four. And then if you look at this group, there's 571 proteins in the group. 286 actually had this EC number. And then you can look at the genera that actually the, the phylet, phylet, phyletic pattern of species that contain this EC number. There's 177 genera in this group. 85 of them contains this EC number, making it um, pretty strong evidence that this gene should be assigned to be a phosphoric monoester hydrolase. So now finally, I'd like to talk about how you can use OrthoMCL to annotate your new genome with OrthoMCL. Ortho so you may have sequenced the new genome and you have a bunch of protein sequences and you wanna figure out what they all do. What do all those genes do? And you would typically have a one file that contains all the protein sequences and all the protein names. I just wanna let you know that this is not just isolated for new genomes. This is functionality that can be used for, say you have 100, 100 proteins of interests that came from various different sources. You can just put them into one FASTA file and then run this workflow and it will predict what ortholog group each protein is in. So it's pretty easy. You click on this link and you upload and select your protein FOSTA file and hit run. And if you gotta wait um, sometimes for a day or two because you're trying to predict, you're doing an, a, a huge blast job um, of all your proteins against all of our proteins. And so that takes a long time, but this is the resulting file, one of the files that you'll get. And in this first column, what you're looking at are the gene that, or the protein that was submitted. And then in the next, next column, the ortholog group that it was assigned to, that our algorithm assigned it to. And this is the reason that it was assigned to this group. It's because its best hit was against this particular protein. And the score was 1.72 times 10 to the minus 163. That's, that's a really good re results, likely not due to chance. It has a 100% identity to this protein and it shares 100% 100, 100, um, 100 of its protein sequence um, was covered in this, this um, target gene. Now you might notice that these gene names are the same as these. This was a test to make sure that it's all working. And so when I submit all these protein sequences, um, I'm getting the, as top hits um, the proteins that I expect and it's assigning it to the group. So now you have all your proteins, all the ortholog groups, and then what you can do, I, I, I'm, I was gonna leave off here, but I, I, I feel like I should just mention that it's not just useful to have all of this uh, all, all these groups, but actually what the functions are. And you can actually download all the functions of all these groups from OrthoMCL, and you can sort of merge it with all of these genes so that you'll have um, your gene, all of your genes with an assigned function. So I was gonna just quickly show you an example of that.
So here I'm at ortho MCL. I'm, I'm looking at a, 133 ortholog groups and you just can, like at all our websites, you can download. I'm gonna clear all. The only thing I care about are the keywords of the group. And then you have every group here with all of its keywords. And um, you can imagine all of your genes of interest with all of these keywords that would basically help you determine what every single gene in your genome is doing. So I will stop here and answer any questions and, and pass it off to Omar. Great, thank you, uh, Mark. And I know David uh, entered a, an important uh, clarification in the chat, so if you haven't got a chance to read that, uh, go ahead and do that. That's that's quite useful. Well, Omar, if I may, I, I mean, yeah, without repeating all of that, um, I just want to point out that the, the the concept of orthology and parology is 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 slightly complicated, and the important driving point is that we are using orthology and parology not so much from an evolutionary sense but to try to help users of ViewPathDB resources uh, identify function. So as Mark correctly you know, indicated, by grouping orthologs, meaning proteins that were present in the last common ancestor between species with any recent duplications, we can guess that those might have the same function. Whereas proteins that may have uh, duplicated a long time ago um, may have had an opportunity to diverge more rapidly. For example, taking an ancestral hypoxanthine, guanine, phosphoribosyl transferase, duplicating that and having one specialized for, uh, for modifying, hypoxanth making hypoxanthine and another uh, guanine. Um, that's really the point is that the goal is to try to uh, help you infer function as we've been using it in this workshop. Okay, any other questions or comments from other instructors? Hello, I have a question. Yes, Emma, go ahead. I don't know, um, I think you can help me. I would like to, um, I'm working with the Agin HSP 70 from um, Tripanosoma Nesimania to uh, identify, identify the presence of the parasites on wild type animals collected no, from wild, wild animals. And I would like to uh, know how to make an alignment of uh, several HSP-70 genes from several species to identify a common regions to design oligos. How can I do this? Right, so so if you actually have the sequences, so you're generating the sequences yourself as 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 you know you have specific primers for HSP seventy and you're you're um, uh, amplifying and sequencing from the roadkill basically. Yes, I'm doing it, this, but I would like because I'm doing this with a, a, a premise that other design that they they are useful for uh, this manner. But I would like to try to see if there is a more conservative uh, region, for example, by, for amplified trypanosomas or other related. Right, so so one option is to to go to the HSP70 gene um, mm -hmm. in, in Leishmania and look at the orthologs uh -huh. across yeah. all TriTripDB basically, and um, and find out if, uh, and do an alignment there and find out if they are conserved, do a DNA alignment basically, and find out if they are conserved uh, regions there. Uh, but another thing you can do, and, and let me go to, um, oops, sorry, not sure why it's doing a screen capture. Let's try that again. Um, try a new window. Um, so I'm just gonna go to try to DB. Um, so another option uh, that, may be useful to you is we have this uh, population biology or popset data sets. These are um, sequences that come from GenBank for anybody who's deposited a um, uh, isolate data. And it's usually single locus or multi-locus data. It may not be in the entire gene, but it could be fragments of a, of a gene. And in, and in this case, you'd be interested in finding any isolate that has uh, that was typed using um, uh, the the um, locus sequence name in this case, which would be HSP70. 
I don't know the answer to this. The answer maybe we don't have many, but but let's see and find out. So I'm just going to type uh, HSP seventy, um, and so here is this one for example, HSP seventy. But you'll see that there are many of them, right? So sometimes people call them different things depending on on when they uploaded the data to the database. So you may have to do a little bit more uh, combination searches to get all of these. But let's pick one of them just for the sake of doing it. Um, or the other option, instead of using uh, looking for a specific domain, what we can do is we can we can do a, a search here, a text search, and just do um, let's try HSP seventy. Um, there could be variations of this, but let's try this. This is going to look for you know I saw here the top one had HSP seventy in it, and a bunch of the other ones had HSP seventy in there. So I'm assuming I'll get all of them. So let's give it a try. So what this is going to do, it's going to find uh, any uh, locus that was typed, again, these are not genes, these are population biology data sets, which ultimately could correspond to genes. Uh, and now you'll see here, these are all the, the genes that are returned. The gene product description is, is HSP70 here. Um, this is the description from the study they came from. And now you can, uh, and they're 925. So you can, in theory, extract these, right, download these sequences, and now compare them to each other. And now you're actually not only looking at the, the HSP70 from the gene page, which is part of the, the genome annotation, you're actually capturing HSP70 from um, uh, isolates that were typed by different people all over the world from all of these different um, organisms. And you'll see that there's some trypanosoma in here. We can take a look at these. And um, the majority are coming from Leishmania, 817 of them, um, mm -hmm. but we can see that trypanosoma, there are 89 occurrences from trypanosoma, you, right? So these are, yeah, sorry. maybe, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, how did you open this in Workplug? Ah, so anytime uh, with any of these, uh, the results here, uh -huh. wherever there is a little graph, uh -huh. that yeah. gives you some kind of um, graphical representation of the data that's in the column. Sometimes it's a, it's a word cloud if it's words, uh -huh. um, and if it's numbers, I don't think we have one here with numbers, if it's numbers, then it will it'll be um, it'll give you a histogram basically of the results. It's basically a quick and dirty way for you to to analyze what's in your column here for all the data that's in here. Um, and so this allowed me to very quickly look at this and see that oh, trypanosoma there are eighty nine occurrences, whereas Glishmania there are you know uh, eight hundred. So um, and then to download this data, you can just click on uh, download, or you could add a step and say, well, I want to really restrict it to uh, the taxon, right, to the strain. And then here I can, I can say, well, I just want the, um, oh, I want to make sure I only get anything that has trypanosoma in it, right? <laughs> so you can do that. And this will include obviously many different things. Obviously there'll be things in here maybe that you don't want, but in any case, let's just start with this. Um, and so now it tells me, and <clears throat> so it's good, it gave me 88. It's, I, th I think I said 89 before, so one is missing for some reason, but 88. Uh, population biology data sets that come from trypanosoma species, uh, genera basically, and it tells you from where they're coming all over the world. And now I can download these if I want. And I can, um, let's see if I can download the sequence. I'm not sure if I can download the sequence, let's give it a try. But if you can download the sequence, you can definitely download the accession number and then you can extract them from um, uh, from GenBank. Actually, we do have the sequence. So here it is. It's it's not of a FASTA format. It should be similar to FASTA format. So let's take away the sequence. Um, and now if I download these, I'm just going to show them in my browser. Let's see what they look like. And you get here, the you get the ID. You can actually search this in GenBank so you can get more information about it. It comes down with the, the species, the geographic location, and also the sequence right here. So now you can take these align them to each other and see if there are things that are in common between them to generate your primers. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Sure, yeah, and, and again, as usual, if something wasn't clear, just get back to us with a question and the, the help line and we're happy to get on Zoom with you again quickly to clarify things or just respond by, by email. Okay. Cool, any other uh, questions from anybody else? Are there things in the chat? Aha, so there's a question about, uh, from uh, Eli, and there's a question about um, the unique and non-unique uh, transcripts. 
Um, and so, I mean, the basic answer to that is that if you have uh, genes that have uh, repetitive regions in them, or there's some gene duplication, then you can imagine you have a, a sequence read that can align to more than one place. Uh, in which case it's considered non-unique. We don't know, you know, the, the algorithm will not know, is it coming from here in, by, uh, in real life or is it coming from here or is it coming from both places? Um, and so those are considered non-unique aligners. Um, and so you could imagine finding a place where um, there is, uh, 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 could be a multiple genes in a row and it looks like they're not expressed. But if you look at the non-unique aligners, there's a lot of expression from that region it's just that we, we don't know, we can't make a determination as to whether it is a single gene that's giving that large sort of expression, or is it, a, um, is it more than that? Is it all the genes together giving the, the expression? Uh, David, you have your hand up, so go ahead, please. Yeah, let me just give a, it's a good question. It's come up in a couple of the breakout rooms that I've been associated with over the last couple of days. So let me try to just give a, a practical example of where this might be important. Let's imagine that you're looking in human cells that are infected with HIV for the level of expression of HIV genes, and you're looking at the reverse transcriptase, um, you're very interested in how much reverse transcriptase expression there is as an indication of how heavy the HIV infection, uh, the, the infection is. And you do, and you are, so you're only interested in reads that map to the uh, reverse transcriptase gene. But if the human genome is, is shot full of, of uh, multiple copies of retrotransposed bits of transposons that have a pieces of non-functional reverse transcriptase, um, those will show up as non-unique mappers. So if you only look at the non-unique, if you only look at unique mapping, you'll get a very misleading uh, result. Similarly, in the parasites that we're interested in, if you are interested, for example, in the expression of the PARP gene, the original defining virulence factor in, in trypanosomes in their insect stages, the PARP gene is duplicated in the genome, I don't know, 10 or 20 times. And so we don't know which of those genes is expressed. So if you're looking at, at what the expression is for gene one, PARP gene one or two or three, um, we can't give you an answer because there's very little unique mapping. But if you just want to know about the total expression, then, then uh, that's what, that, what you'd like to look at. In contrast, if you're looking at one specific gene that you want to know that's expressed, the best way to look at that is probably by looking at only the unique mappers. So there's no one size fits all answer. And that's why we give you the ability to look at both. Thanks, David. Um, okay, so I'm gonna uh, quickly, please continue adding questions to the chat and we'll continue answering them. And as, as you know, uh, as has been tradition, we we keep the Zoom um, open uh, beyond the workshop time. So if you have burning questions, please feel to hang around and ask us those questions. So what I wanted to do is spend just a few minutes, uh, hopefully not too many minutes, to um, uh, give you an example of where leveraging, how you can leverage orthology that, that uh, Mark has been talking about. So, and, and I know we already ex we got exposed to this a little bit. We've done the orthology transform from one species to another or one strain to another. And also we have the, the orthology phylogenetic pattern where you can say, well, I want genes that follow a particular phylogenetic profile um, in my, um, in my uh, results. Uh, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be, I'm looking at the ViewPathDB site. So this includes data from all across ViewPathDB uh, databases. Um, it, in, it includes most of the data, not all of the data. We're still working on integrating some other data types. So, so you might be interested in searching a specific data type in ViewPathDB that's available in PlasmoDB, but then you realize, oh shoot, I can't really use it in, in ViewPathDB. I can only use it in, in PlasmoDB for now, but that's coming soon. Hopefully you'll be able to um, run all the analyses. So, um, but let's imagine I'm a cryptosporidium researcher and I would like to find uh, genes that are potentially expressed in, um, in mammals, uh, in cryptosporidium, and are uh, essential, for example. But cryptosporidium, until recently, has been very uh, uh, unavailable for genetic, you know, large scale genetic uh, analyses or genetic manipulation. Um, and so maybe, you know, you would 
we decide, well, I wish I could leverage data from another related um, apicoplexin organism. And maybe by, by, if I can do that, if I can ask the question in let's say toxoplasma and then find the homologs in cryptosporidium, well, maybe that's good enough to get started. Because remember, all you're trying to do here is you're trying to, um, uh, you're trying to narrow down your list of genes that you can potentially take on for further analysis in the lab. So I'm gonna get started. And I know that in, in toxoplasma, there's been this experiment where, uh, and we talked about it the other day, where uh, every single gene was knocked out using CRISPR and then the fitness of the parasite was determined. And so you can get, you know, as a proxy, you can get a, an idea about how essential are genes. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and look for that search. So I'm gonna look for a CRISPR search here. There's a CRISPR phenotype search. So we'll go here, and if you need more information about this, you can you can obviously take look down here in the description section. And this is basically uh, a representation of all the genes in the toxoplasma genome. And the more negative a, a gene's fitness is, or phenotype in this case, the more um, uh, drastically it affected the phenotype of the parasite. So essentially, you're saying things that are on this side are are more essential than things that are on that side in this stage of the parasite that was assayed in this particular experiment. And there are some example genes here that are uh, known genes in toxoplasma that you can use as a, as a, as a relative way to, to think about uh, where your genes of interest fall. So for example, you may go in here and say, well, anything that is between minus five and, and, and whatever the lowest number here is minus six point something, three minus 6.89, uh, anything between minus five and minus 6.89, I'm gonna consider really just essential genes in, in toxoplasma. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. So I, I'm, I'm setting this parameter to, so this is minus five to minus uh, or 6.89. And I'm going to return any gene that in tox, again, of course, this is, a, is an experiment that was done on toxoplasma. So I'm gonna return any gene in toxoplasma that met these criteria, okay? So I found 368 genes that are potentially essential in, in toxoplasma. I also know that in, in toxoplasma, there was an experiment that looked at expression of genes in uh, cat stages of toxoplasma. So maybe I can, I can pretend a little bit here and say, well, if the gene is expressed in toxoplasma cat stages, maybe it is also a gene that's expressed in cryptosporidium when it's uh, going through its sexual differentiation in, in the gut of, uh, of uh, a cow or a gut of a human. And so, so let me go ahead and I'm gonna intersect this CRISPR result with a result from my uh, RNA-seq experiment, which um, again, I'm familiar with it. It's an, um, uh, a cat experiment. Uh, so these are enterocytes. Um, and here's the feline Toxoplasma gondii, uh, feline enterocytes. I'm gonna pick this full change query. Hopefully now you're a little bit getting a bit more comfortable with these types of searches, but just as a reminder, I'm gonna look for genes that are upregulated. Let's keep it at twofold between, um, let's pick this uh, tachyzoid and tissue cyst stages and all of these enterocyte stages, okay? So basically these are my numerator, these are my denominator. So I'm basically saying that these uh, uh, genes, uh, the um, genes, um, expression of genes in these samples should be twofold higher than genes from these samples. And I can also change this parameter to, uh, let's change this to maximum and minimum. So I'm basically saying this twofold difference, this is very stringent, right? This twofold difference should be between the lowest uh, expression value from the samples in my comparison group, the red group here, compared to the maximum of the blue group right here, okay? So let's run the search. And so I run the search and I get zero results. And I think, okay, well, maybe, maybe I'm, I, I was just too stringent, right? With my, with my parameters. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna revise this step and I'm gonna change it to average, okay? Again, so now this is a little bit less stringent so that twofold differences between the average of these samples and the average of those samples. And I'm gonna revise my step and the answer is zero again. So obviously this is a bit concerning. So now we can take a look at each one of these. I'm gonna look at these toxoplasma RNA sequence samples, these 1,647 genes. Some of them must be essential. So why are they not showing up? You know, there are some really important genes here that I know should be essential, right? And, and, but they're not coming up as essential. So what's going on? 
So one thing I'm uh, as a as I do this, and in fact, I, I I made this mistake earlier as I was trying this out. I was looking at this and I thought, oh look, there's this is a Toxoplasma gondii ME49 gene, right? It's from the strain ME49 because this experiment was done using a strain that then when they analyzed the data, we analyzed it, it was mapped to the ME49 uh, genome. The CRISPR experiment right here, so if we look at this 368 genes, these are all Toxoplasma gondii GT1. It's a different strain. So these are different gene IDs. So of course, if I try and intersect these apples with these oranges, right, I'm gonna get zero results, right? Because they're, they're very different entities. The gene IDs don't look similar at all. Or, uh, and so, what I need to do is I need to have a way to convert one of these to the gene IDs from the other one, right? So if there was a way for me to convert these GT1 IDs to ME49 IDs by homology or orthology, then I'll be in business, right? So let's go ahead and try this. So I could delete the step and now add the orthology transform. I think many of you tried the orthology transform, but we have a really cool feature in here. If I click on edit, I can insert a step before, okay? So I'm gonna click on insert step before. You'll see here this, this diagram, if you didn't notice, it actually is, is giving you a cue of, of what, what you're actually doing. So I'm, I'm trying to fill in this blank here, this step before. And in my case, I wanna look for a transform step. So I'm gonna transform my GT1 genes into ME49 genes so I can get an intersection with my genes that are upregulated in enterocyte uh, stages. So I'm gonna go ahead and select orthologs. And now all I need to do is select ME49 and I'll select ME49 and run this stuff. So now what happens is I've done this orthology, orthology transform step, and I found now that out of my homologs of my essential GT1 genes, there are 61 ME49 genes that are also upregulated in the uh, CAT stages, in the enterocyte stages. Okay, that's great. So I'm still working in the, in the, in the toxoplasma world, but now I may ask, well, if any of these genes have homolog and cryptosporidium, those are the ones I really wanna work on. So I wish there was a way for me to convert these between uh, uh, toxoplasma and, and cryptosporidium. And hopefully you should right away think, oh yeah, I can run the orthology transform. I just saw Omar do it here with, uh, with changing from uh, GT1 to ME49. So why not um, uh, find homologs when I compare between ME49 and cryptosporidium? So I'm gonna add a step here. I'm gonna transform by orthology. I'm gonna transform the 61 genes to orthologs and I'm gonna select cryptosporidium and I'm gonna select all of the cryptosporidia. I don't care, as long as one cryptosporidium has a homolog, I wanna return it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and run the search. And now the 61 genes have 624 orthologs across uh, all cryptosporidia. And if you wanna look at the distribution of these in the different cryptos the cryptosporidium species, this organism filter here on the left is quite handy. I'm gonna expand all. And if we scroll down here to the apicomplexa, that's where cryptosporidium falls. And if I scroll down a little bit more, uh, at some point I'm gonna find uh, the coccidiae here and they're 368 and scrolling down now, I should slowly start seeing um, somewhere in here, I should slowly start seeing, let me go back up here. Ah, so one mistake I made is notice here, I'm looking at this yellow box here. I'm looking at this first step, so let's go ahead and look at this last step here. Um, and so these are the 624 genes. And so now if I scroll down uh, and look here, I should find cryptosporidium. I could see the distribution of these genes across the different cryptosporidium organisms. And if I really was only interested in, um, in uh, cryptosporidium hominis, for example, I can click here and I can filter the results to see only the cryptosporidium hominis, uh, hominis genes in my, in my list, okay? So now I'm gonna add another step and I'm gonna try and leverage the orthology phylogenetic profile search. So I'm now confident that I have a list of uh, cryptosporidium genes that are homologs of genes expressed in the cat stages, the sexual stages of toxoplasma and are essential. So now what I would like to do is I would like to find any of these genes that do not have homologs in humans because maybe I'm interested in uh, designing a vaccine, a potential vaccine, and maybe, uh, you know, I'll make sure that I'm not designing a vaccine against a protein that has uh, homologs in humans. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and find out if any of these genes in this list do not have orthologs in humans. And so I'm going to add a step. And now instead of doing an orthology transform, I'm going to look for genes, but I'm going to look for genes based on the phylogenetic profile. And I'm going to pick this phylogenetic profile search. 
And now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to return, um, I guess in my case, I care about Apicomplexa, so I'll just select Apicomplexa here. But now I'm going to select the phylogenetic profile that I'm interested in. And in my case, I'm, I, I want to make sure that whatever gene is returned from this search does not have an ortholog in humans. Okay, so I'm going to open up Metazoa, Chordata, Mammalia, and then as I scroll down here, here Homo sapiens. If I click once, it's a checkbox. That means that any gene returned must have an ortholog in, in uh, Homo sapiens. But actually, I want it to be an X. So if I click one more time, I get an X here. So that means that any gene that's returned from the search does not have a human gene in its orthology group, right? And I'm going to take the results from this search and I'm going to intersect them with my previous one, which was the cryptosporidium genes that are orthologs of toxoplasma genes that are expressed in cat stages and that are um, essential. And so now when we run this step, you'll get 43 genes uh, that now I'm, I'm fairly confident that are potentially genes that I should explore further as potential therapeutic targets, maybe in cryptosporidium based on their uh, leveraging experiments from other species and strains um, across the ViewPathDB world. And, and this is not limited to just Apicomplexa. You may know of an experiment that was done in fungi, for example, or, or mycetes uh, that, that you think can be leveraged to find some specific function or important feature in your uh, species of interest. So I'll stop here. Uh,